Welcome to Tycoons of Small Biz, a podcast where small business owners are celebrated as the backbone of the American economy. Each week, we introduce you to tycoons who share their stories and advice so that small business owners may learn from their experiences. Tycoons is powered by Backbone Planning Partners and Pivotal Advisors. Join us now as our hosts connect you to today's tycoons. Good afternoon, tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I am your host here, as always, Austin Peterson, coming to you live from Phoenix, Arizona, the home of last week's Super Bowl and Waste Management Open. So there were a lot, a lot, a lot of people here in the Phoenix Valley. But uh, I think we had a, a successful Waste Management Open tournament as well as a Super Bowl. So we were happy to have uh, everybody here in town and uh, and everything went off without a hitch. So Today happens to be Valentine's Day, and so our today's guest is uh, is very excited about being my Valentine today. But uh, before I get to the guest and and what it is that uh, that we're here to talk about, if this is the first time you're listening to Tycoons of Small Biz and you're wondering what it is that we do here and and why you should be interested in listening to the program, we're a small business podcast that's put together by small business owners for small business owners. And our sole purpose is to prop up the small business owner, give them an opportunity to share their story, share their successes, share share their failures uh, as an opportunity to get their business's name out there, as well as for other listeners to be able to listen in and learn from their mistakes, their failures, their successes, whatever it is. And uh, and hopefully um, we're going to inspire other entrepreneurs to get involved because the small business owner community truly is the backbone of the American economy. We believe in it 100%. And so we decided in May of 2020 to launch this podcast and, and give this platform this opportunity for small mm-hmm. businesses to tell their story. So with that being said, today, we definitely have a tycoon on the podcast with us today. We've got Ismael Navarro. He's a founder and CEO of Countervail. Countervail is a, a cybersecurity or cyber defense organization, a smaller you know boutique organization that's based in Bellevue, Washington. So Ismail, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, like we discussed in in the pre-show, I'm going to call you Izzy just because I'm afraid I will mispronounce Ismael. <laughs> oh, cool. I don't. No problem. Yeah, so uh, Izzy, before we jump into kind of the business side of things and and you know kind of what it is you guys do at Countervail, let's start with the personal side. Tell us your history. Tell us where you grew up. You know what you did before. Now, did you go to college? If you did, what did you study? That sort of thing. So we kind of know who uh, who you are as a person. Of course. Okay. Yeah. So actually grew up in Southern California, a small town. I was born in in Los Angeles and raised there for about seven years before my father's like, you know, LA is becoming kind of a cesspool. So let's just drive far Southeast as possible. SoCal. And then just grew up in like this unknown community. I even probably said it, nobody would know where it's at, but um, went to college and actually studied information assurance and cybersecurity. Uh, so a Bachelor of Science and MS uh, degrees as well. Uh, studied a bit entrepreneurial studies at Wharton, which is a great school. And I'm trying to kind of high level this, you know, for the show. Uh, and then actually before all of this, I actually went into the military when I was 17. So I graduated early. My mom signed a waiver so I could go in and went in and basically became an operator and, um, you know, was in the military for about six years active duty, went in National Guard for two years, two years in the reserves, and then two years, what they call inactive before, you know, ETS, honorable discharge. I was out supporting 75th, so I had two MOS. And outside of that, when I, when I came home, I did a bunch of various gigs, but then started to get into the security field, which was the physical security field, which was uh, intervention, corporate espionage, Sabrosa, and to, to your audience that may not know what that is, it's like private investigations. Sometimes that meant like working the Grammys or sometimes, you know, executive protection meant working for entertainers or their family members or making sure like, when I say intervention, uh, monitoring their children at a distance. So if anything happens to them or somebody tries to do something like outside threat, um, you intervene in um, those kind of situations from an investigative standpoint, did everything from like marriage, domestic, work joint task force with local law enforcement. So then I had this big security background 
And then my body was just getting beat up from it over the years, you know, just being in the field, being physical, not being able to keep up with the younger guys. You know, obviously at some point there's like a deterioration point where you just get too old for it. Decided to go into school, got my degree and then started consulting. I mean, at that time, back in 2009, you know, if you could spell IT, you had like a security consulting gig right away. They're like, hey, help me fix this. Help me fix that. So that's kind of how it got started. And then I just became a consultant. And then I think after that, just doing consulting gigs and then working for huge enterprises, uh, I just decided, you know what, I need to just start my own practice. And then it kind of developed from there. And then I have two product offerings that I've been developing since I was at Microsoft back in 2014. And I've authored, you know, different things for Microsoft and other large vendors, when I say author things, I mean, you know, for your audience is like uh, what we call content or detection, things that help the organization detect and identify threats. Uh, and I know that's a pretty fast high level, but, you know, that's, that's where I'm at today now is, you know, trying to advise and help people, you know, optimize and, and help them get to a better place within their organization. Um, so high impact and meaningful things for chief information security officers you know, and help them better inform their leadership, the C-suite, CEO, CEO, CIO, CTO, whoever they're, you know, they fall under for for their leadership, anything from there and just giving guidance and, and helping people in their organizations just do the right thing, making sure that they're well informed on, on what they're on their decision making. Yeah, I mean, I, I find your background intriguing because I think it's probably pretty rare to have somebody who has expertise, background, and experience in both physical security and cybersecurity, right? Like, I'm sure everybody listening is thinking, well, cybersecurity is all the, the nerds, the glass, the glass wearing, you know, 140 pound, five foot six guy versus, you know, the physical security, the guy who's the bodyguard, the guy who's protecting somebody's children, the guy who was an operator in the military, is a completely different, and and the fact that you have both is, is kind of intriguing and interesting to me. I actually got made fun of. Like, I didn't realize there's like this reverse nerd psychology when you go to college for the technical world. You get called like a bro tech, or they they stereotype you as like, what are you doing here? You know, like this this isn't your this isn't your lane. So it's kind of funny because I did go to school with that kind of reverse bullyism or whatever you want to call it. Like the nerds gang up on you, like, you don't know what this is, ha ha, and they like point at you, and it's so, so it was funny, it's it's kind of a funny thing, but, you know, got through, and I, I made a lot of good friends, and today I still have those friends, some of them in a DOD, DHS, and I have some friends that are also private sector as well, all over, both in sales, and a lot of the cyber defense umbrellas, so, but yeah, physical security, I mean, my first I would say black market buyer, what, what then was like dark web or what really people didn't know about it was they were stealing shipments. Um, and I didn't mean to derail, but just to give you an example, they were stealing shipments of colognes and sunglasses from these warehouses, but they would sell them on the dark web. So at the time when I was doing physical security, that's how I really learned about cyber defense was like way back in, I want to say 2004, 2006, I ran a joint task force and they have a guy like me, you know, who's tatted up, who just looks like a normal criminal, I guess. I go in there and I do the black market buy and then boom, you know, cops come in, raid the warehouse. And then I come out and I'm, you know, they do the handcuff, you know, dog and pony show and, you know, the rest is history. But how they, they find out about that is, was all through, you know, cybersecurity, like, making the buy online in the dark web and then going to the physical warehouse. And then, you know, it's like an end to end, um, you know, the, the way it's staged, right. So the whole process of law enforcement, them getting their staging, then setting up, hiring an outside consulting to come in and do, but that, that was kind of typical, you know, drug buys, things that they couldn't use local law enforcement for, you know, um, of course they have their own undercover um, officers as well, but um, the need is so high. But again, same thing with cybersecurity. The need is so high for defenders as operators that, you know, it was just a smart decision for me to lateral over into the digital world. So it's just like the next evolving. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I've been exposed to cybersecurity a decent amount in in my lifetime just because what I do in my day job is people's personal information is being used 
and and as a part of of what I do, right? And so we have to protect that, and you know, do put everything in place that we can to to protect that. And so you know, maybe I've been exposed more than the average citizen. Maybe I, I don't. I couldn't say that for sure, but you know, I think this this terminology of the dark web gets thrown around but I'm not sure that most people understand what the dark web is. And for me personally, one, because I'm not looking for illicit stuff. Right. But, but two, like if somebody told me to go on the dark web and look for something, I wouldn't even know how to access the dark web. Right. So maybe not, let's not give a step-by-step, you know, how to access the dark web, but, define it, explain for those listening, you know, what, what the dark web really is and what it entails. The dark web is really just a set of what we call servers or nodes or these, these endpoints, like a regular, just think of a computer, a a network that is anonymized or virtually anonymized, right? So basically keeping you private when you're in there, private to entering, right? I mean, there's methodology for people to find out who you are if you don't use the dark web. It's something that I discuss with certain people because some people are just like, hey, can I just go to XYZ ABC 89.onion, which is an onion router. And for those of your, you know, your listeners who don't understand that, it's like dot onion like dot com is like a route to get you to a destination, whether that's it could be something as simple as like an anonymized chat or something as horrible as like public execution or WikiLeaks files or finding out bad things about the government or whatever it is. But effectively, there's a, a longer process that you should use if you're going to, if you're curious about logging into the dark web for, for non-nefarious reasons, right? If you just want to understand what that is, typically you don't want to use your own laptop and go directly through your own router. I mean, you open yourself up to you know, all kinds of evil things if you do that, of course, because primarily the, what we call the dark web, again, it's, it's made up of a lot of nefarious activity, right? Because it's anonymized. It's, it's, it's hidden. Even the websites, like I just said, it's like abcdxyz989.onion. Like you don't, it doesn't say like, I'm going to www watch this execution.com. I mean, there might be something inside there that, that will link you to a room that's like that, but get to the route. It's like an encrypted, what we call like a, a hash looking type uh, domain name, if you will, with dot onion at the end of it. For, for anybody who's interested, I mean, there's a great film called Cicada 3301, which if you want to like talk about the glamorizing it or seeing what it's kind of all about. It's a great film to watch because it's actually uh, predicated upon actual things that have happened, uh, true events. Um, Sakata 3301 is like this real unknown anonymized organization that put these encrypted uh, cryptographic tasks out there for people to complete. But that would give your audience like more of a visual, you know, experience of what that looks like. And it, it kind of encompasses all the different things that can be done on there from translating your Bitcoin or trying to wash your Bitcoin or trying to look at something as just having a, a, a freedom chat or something that, you know, some people call these things freedom chats where you actually feel comfortable in a group speaking about things that you have in common with other people that might seem scary to others, like like NRA or gun rights or abortion things or, you know, whatever it may be. I mean, you can virtually hit anything in in, in what we call the dark web. So, I mean, the, the last example you gave, I would say, is is a way to legitimately use the dark web, right? Like, you want to be able to interact with people that maybe share your views without everybody knowing that you have those same views, I guess. So, I, I would term that as, you know, legitimate, right? But nefarious is like anything you can think of. Illicit oh, and, drugs, and, 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 execution, you know, all that kind of stuff that any anything you can think of. And, and that's what I kind of warn people about. It's like, and, and I won't get into like the programs like Tails and Tours and using a USB and logging in from virtualized environments and using multiple VPN hops and all of this crazy stuff that like to best secure yourself if you're going to go into the dark web, right? 
But that's actually what's needed if you want to secure your, you know, especially if you have kids or, you, you know, I mean, if you're just some single guy out of an apartment, you're not going to live there longer than six months in your ISP. But again, somebody could effectively get your information, um, you know, if you, because it's it's like engaging, right? It's like the same thing if you go to Starbucks, right? So I tell people this too, it's like, um, and forgive this example, this is, it's, it's a very blunt and crass example, but it's like you go to Starbucks, you log into their Wi-Fi. It's kind of akin to sharing a condom with everybody in that room. It's like everybody's touching the same thing, right? This, this, this tangible thing, which is the Wi-Fi, the Starbucks Wi-Fi, you log into it. You absolutely have no idea of what you're putting yourself into. And so typically, like one of those defense things is like, use a VPN if you're going to do that, which is like, you know, you can use like Nord or, you know, Bitdefender, you can use any, any one of the VPNs, but, you know, using some sort of basic standard security. Again, I, I don't prefer logging into it, but that's like one of the examples I can give you um, or your audience. If, you know, depending on, I'm kind of generalizing too, for your audience, there might be some people out there like who are really technically savvy. You're like, what is this guy talking about? You know, and like, I would say this, this, and this, but, Again, I'm not going to inundate your audience who has no idea what Tails and Tor is or using an external drives with multiple VPN hops or, you know, securing your router, putting firewalls up, using open source PF sense or something like that. I, I, you know, that would take forever on one segment of just navigating the dark web as properly as possible, right? And using like IP vanish, NordVPN, something, multiple hops, multiple proxies. But some people just log directly in and they're like from their home ISP, their internet service provider, Verizon, Comcast. And it's like anybody can track you at that point uh, yeah. if they wanted to effectively. Well, I mean, speaking as a guy who I would consider semi tech savvy, about 70 percent of the terms that you just used, you may have been you may as well have been speaking a foreign language. <laughs> <laughs> and see, and I have to apologize for that because I just, you know, that's what I'm saying and without trying to inundate the audience. Right. So there is a tool out there and what we call OST. It's an open source tool, meaning anybody can have access to it. And a buddy of mine wrote this tool. Actually, it's called Spiderfoot. And you can tell whether or not your email address has been used for the dark web it'll tell you somebody has used your email address for the dark web and it goes out there and collects all this information but effectively you can log into this tool and use it and find out if your email has been compromised to search the dark web and that's what some attackers will do they will feed off of your information and your data points what i call your pivot points your email your facebook your instagram what have you and these are all these are all pivot points for attackers. They they, you know, they're just hiding places, um, harboring grounds. All right. So the average listener for our for our show is similar to the average guest that we have on the show. They're they're operating an organization that does typically between three and ten million in revenue. Some as high as fifty, some as high as you know hundred. But the the typical guest and listener for our show is that three to 10 million in revenue. So for somebody who's listening and, and knows they're running an organization that needs to be protected, what's critical for them to know and to have in place in terms of cybersecurity for their, for their business? It's going to sound very simple, but it's just the correct answer is that you have to understand what is your most exposed asset or your most valuable asset. And you have to always start there. So let's say if you have a company that's, let's say it's a CPA or a legal firm that runs like, you know, 20 paralegals or whatever, right? Whatever the example is for this organization. But let's say they have a server that houses maybe credit card information or personal files about their clients, you know, privileged, what we call ACP or privileged information. They want that to not get out there in the open and they want to secure that data. Uh, there was a breach in Los Angeles. I won't go into that, but, you know, these things can cost millions, 30, hundred million dollars, you know, if you lose that data. So they, the short answer is you want to, you want to identify what your most valuable asset is you have in your organization that is digital and start securing that. And then you work outwards from a very so simplistic point of view. That's, the best way to describe it. There's a multitude of ways to do that, but that's what you need to do is one, identify, and then two, start securing. 
first I'll make a comment and then I'll ask you to expand upon that. So the, the first comment that I would make is there, there are lots of businesses that don't have non-public information about their clients in, in any file, right? And so you would think that that means, well, I'm good, right? I don't, I don't need to worry about cybersecurity, but you still have email for the, for the corporation. And I would argue that the most important asset that most businesses have are the people that work for them. And you do have their non-public information stored somewhere from an HR standpoint, a payroll standpoint, a retirement plan, health benefits, whatever the case may be. So when you say, you know, find out what that is and then secure it, what do you mean by secure it and, and what steps, you know, should they be taking? So this also depends right on their budget. Unfortunately, some people don't see security, as you mentioned, as something that's like a, necess a necessity, right? But I mean, you can get training for cheap, you know, things that help people understand like, hey, don't click on every link that gets sent to you via email. This could compromise our whole entire organization. So when you talk about securing the actual employees that are there or human resources servers, things that carry information about your employees, if that's your most critical asset, it starts with the same thing. You start securing those. And, and that could be by what we call cold storage, you know, backing up that information, storing it so it doesn't have any internet access whatsoever. We can talk about scrubbing it, encrypting the data. There's there's many things that people can do for root, you know, for fairly, fairly cheap, or I should say inexpensive to secure, especially for an organization that's in between three and 10 million maybe finding out if they have like a cyber defense insurance provider that's near them to say, hey, get someone to come in, evaluate my organization, and then see if I can get fitted for cybersecurity insurance and then get that measured up to a certain amount. Those things are relatively inexpensive. You know, you might pay a couple thousand dollars a year depending on your, your premium and, you know, whatever your let's just say your exposure cost is for that. So it's like 1 million, 2 million, 3 million in cybersecurity insurance. You know, the premiums are very low. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of ways that you can help your, your organization. Now, when you talk about security products or maybe a security resource, somebody that's actually there monitoring the systems, helping the internal employees who don't understand cybersecurity, then you have to understand, well, how do you budget for that? And there becomes two things, right? One is, one, the business context, which is, well, how much can I afford from a very general perspective? And then two, the security perspective, right? Okay, well, this security guy is going to cost me 60K or 100K a year. You know, you start to do these evaluation, right? Um, what's You really get no ROI on cybersecurity, right? Your ROI is basically ensuring the fact that you're not going to get compromised. So it's like a necessary cost. It's, you know, like nobody wants to pay their water bill or their light bill, or but they, they have to pay it because you need the lights on, you need your water, just like you need your internet service, you need your employees to have email. You know, if those things go down, then what happens to your business? And it becomes a train of thought of, well, what will this cost me if all of a sudden my Outlook 0365 goes down? And then you start to, as a business owner, does it cost me 2000 a day, 10000 a day, you know, 4000 an hour? And then that's how you start to rationalize your cybersecurity budget. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, there are a lot of things like that in life, right? I mean, auto insurance, health insurance. I'm, I'm never sick. I never go to the hospital. I never go to the doctor. I paid, you know, $12,000 last year in, in health insurance premiums, and I never went to the doctor once, right? Mm -hmm. But you get cancer, for example, and you've got, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, you know, medical expenses that are paid by the insurance company, that's where the value comes in. And I would equate it to something like that. Yeah. It's just like, again, I, I hate to use the metaphor of like needing a condom and not having one as opposed to having one and, and not needing it. You know, it's just one of those things that you just live with. You know, it's one of these things that we accept, but again, as, as cybersecurity operators or cyber defense operators, these are things that we understand and we accept. The businesses that I've seen, I'd hate to say it, but they, they like to tout that they're customer first or customer centric. But when the customer's data is lost or something goes awry, then all bets are just out the window. You know, it's like, what is that fine we're going to pay? 
then the, the budget gets increased and then how is that budget allocated? And then where do we move in our deliverable roadmap to secure whatever has happened in our breach or compromise or, or exposure or data leakage or, or whatever has happened to the organization? So by and large, small, small organizations, nobody's immune. And these things will affect you. If you're a $3 million organization, can you afford to lose $100,000 a month because you didn't do something as you know, simple as maybe just turning off HTML for your email because your employees, and, and ignorance isn't a bad word, right? I just want to say ignorant to, to the fact that like, hey, if you're going to just keep clicking on ransomware emails, when is the time going to come when you stop letting them have HTML as opposed to just plain text emails because they don't know how to differentiate between good and bad, but you need to save your company money, something like that, a two minute fix will cost you nothing, but save you hundred K, you know, and it just depends. You're going to have the griping of the employee. So there's caveats on both ends, but again, it's, it's how we measure our exposure and our risk and what is the risk appetite? If, if you can afford to lose hundred K a month as a $3 million revenue business a year, and you can justify that somehow, then, then more power to you. But um, yep. it's better, better be safe than sorry from, from an operator's perspective. Yeah. I, I think it comes down to understanding and accepting the risk and then deciding whether or not you're going to, you're going to outsource that risk protection to somebody else, meaning another person or insurance or both. So, yeah, I mean, it, come, it comes down to knowledge. And that becomes problematic too, because these organizations, they may not even know who to turn to. They, they might think like the industry standard person, but what, what they're really getting is McDonald's cybersecurity because they're just well-known, good marketing. But, um, you know, that's, again, kind of where Countervail comes in. You know, we're a boutique shop. We only operate within our unique specialties, right? We don't try to go outside of our window because if we did, there's just too much meat on the plate. You know, we can consume everything if we wanted to, but we want to avoid that. We want to operate where we're most high impactful for chief information security officers, where we can help drive decision making for leadership. And then on the granular foot soldier level, we want to be able to empower these engineers and these principal operators to effectively make their, you know, defense posture from a security standpoint, more secure, right? In an organization, if that means turning off their HTML, because they don't understand, you know, why I shouldn't click on every link I get, then you start them there as a baseline, right? It's like putting training wheels on your kid's bike. You start them there and you slowly get them to a mature state, but that comes with simplified training. It's very inexpensive and you kind of move forward from there. And you have to assess every every organization is different. You have to assess, and that's what we do. We assess the status and, and the maturity of an organization. We say, hey, you guys are like maturity state zero. We need to start you here. If we don't, you know, you're you have a potential risk appetite for something very bad to happen. And yeah. Just straightforward. Yeah. So I mean, I operate my own firm. I have a business partner. We operate a firm together, but, uh, and it's, and it's our firm, but we partner from a compliance standpoint and a back office standpoint with a very large organization. And that large organization handles the cybersecurity stuff for us. Right. For me, that's a comfort. Um, maybe not fully necessary, right? If I decided to go and, and handle these things on our own, we, we could technically do it and just outsource it. But, you know, that, that example that you just gave of clicking on links and whatever, like I literally received an email this morning that said, you've received a Valentine's e-card, right? Mm -hmm. from, from one of the other employees or the other members of your organization or whatever. Did I though, you know, <laughs> You start to check different things, right? You look at the email address it came from. You look at the way that it's worded. Are things misspelled? Or, you know, like I've learned some things along the way to, to look out for. And because of this, you know, large organization being in, uh, responsible for all of this, part of my outlook, there's a button that says report phishing, right? right. Mm -hmm. and, and I looked at it and I said, this might be legitimate, but I think... I think this is a phishing, you know, right. it, it's either a true phishing attack 
or it's the back office mimicking phishing attacks because they do that to try to make sure you're staying on high alert, right? Well, that's good that you have that cybersecurity awareness training going on. I mean, that's that's a really good step. It allows yeah. you to get, you know, key performance indicators. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. Yeah, no, you're fine. So I did click report phishing and, and I was right. It was one of their, you know, efforts to try to make sure that we're staying vigilant and watching for certain things. And, and it was, in fact, one of their mimicked phishing attacks. Right. Well, that's good. Yeah. So here I am sitting at 1.30 in the afternoon and I haven't received a Valentine's card yet. So <laughs> and I thought for sure that when I started this morning, I was going to have one, but I didn't. So, all right, uh, Izzy, let's take a quick break. Let's hear a quick call to action for our, from our, uh, or excuse me, for our listeners And then we'll come back. I want to talk a little bit more about your niche. I want to talk about things that you see organizations doing, how we can improve, you know, our own knowledge, those sorts of things. So get a, get a quick drink of water. We'll hear this, we'll hear this call to action. We'll come back and, and discuss further. Hey there, Tycoons. Austin Peterson here, co-host of Tycoons of Small Biz. If you think you have what it takes to be considered a tycoon and you're wondering how you could become a featured guest, please follow and then message us at Tycoons of Small Biz on LinkedIn. We'd love to have a conversation with you to see if it is a mutually good fit. And if so, we'll get you scheduled for an interview. If you're unsure about being a guest on our podcast, but are contemplating selling your business over the next few years and you'd like to know what your business is worth, Please also follow us and then message us on LinkedIn for your no obligation, informal valuation of your business. We look forward to hearing from you and thanks for listening to the Tycoons of Small Biz podcast. And now back to today's program. All right, Tycoons, welcome back. Austin Peterson, your host here with Tycoons of Small Biz. We've got Izzy Navarro from Countervale here with us. We're talking about all things cybersecurity and obviously his background in, in physical security, which is interesting having you know both sides there and, and understanding really what these cybersecurity attacks can lead to, et cetera. So Izzy, you know, before the break, you kind of mentioned Countervail's niche, right? Like the areas that you work in, because there's the, the household names that everybody knows that can do certain cybersecurity things. And And a lot of times what you end up getting, I think you called it the McDonald's version of of cybersecurity because it's, you know, it's well known, but it may not be tailored to your needs as a business owner or as an individual. So talk to us real quick about what makes Countervail unique, what your guys' niche is and and the way that you guys approach things with your clients. Sure. So at a very high level, as I as I mentioned earlier, everything that's very high impactful, right? So one leadership typically has a deliverable to a chief information security officer that that gets disseminated. It could be a project from endpoint detection. It could be a project on implementing a a solution like Splunk, which is a log management solution. It could be a range of different things. It could be vulnerability threat management. It could be project management on an end-to-end deliverable that's, let's say, two to $3 million. Where we come in is we specialize in understanding what the project need is, the deliverable time frame, and, and really understanding what the pain points are of the chief information security officer. So we come in and, as I stated, we, we assess what's actually happening with a project or even a simple deliverable. It could be something as simple as we need content. What that means is we need someone to write detections for us. So it just depends on what that customer is looking for. I think what makes us unique is that everybody that works for Countervail is pre-vetted. We all have, you know, many years of experience in different tool vertical spaces. So vulnerability threat management, some people have been pen testers, some people have operated with, let's say, firewalls, EDR, and maybe web application firewalls. But everybody has a very in-depth knowledge from a cyber defense perspective on solutions, architecture, operations, uh, how things should be implemented, what a best practice is. And the reason we know this is because we have well-documented processes, not only from the vendor space, but also categorized and indexed throughout all of the different clients that we've engaged. So from, let's say, one healthcare provider to another, we can kind of create like a Venn diagram and say, well, what is this healthcare provider doing that is more mature than this one over here. And then we create a process and that process becomes a staple. 
So then it doesn't matter what organization that we land in, whether it's a bank, a healthcare provider, an insurance provider, a retail, like Nordstrom or, or somebody like this, we, we get an understanding of what that vertical space looks like. And then we only focus on our one deliverable and we make sure that that outcome is always optimized and result driven. So um, if there's deliverable dates, if the PMO or the project management office or the chief information security officer is not getting relevant, uh, actionable intelligence, or they're not getting informed intelligence to make better decisions, or their metrics are disrupted and they're providing wrong metrics to leadership, we come in and actually evaluate what the problem is. Where's the gap? Where's the delta between the people they're hiring? Maybe in some of the big four, I hate to name any of the big four companies. And I'm not saying that they're bad. I'm just saying that it's kind of like that McDonald's of, you know, you hire one of these big four, they're going to throw 20 resources at it. And they're just, they're just there to really manage a product, a product or a project and not really have the depth and breadth that we have because we focused in it. Everything that we've done is cyber defense oriented, where some of the big four, they work on many different things like auditing, or they work on administrative or technical writing. We don't try to run the gambit of everything. We focus on unique problems. And that could be like, why isn't our data stream working? And then we come in and say, well, this is what we've observed. And then we kind of solution for it. So we pick apart the different problems and we solution for those as opposed to trying to like re-architect or bring in 20 resources. Uh, we work best when our operators are fit uniquely for whatever that problem is and typically provided on, on a high impact project, usually disseminated down to the CISO from like leadership, like CEO or uh, CIO is saying, hey, we need to implement EDR. Hey, we need you know, to increase our firewall zoning. But then nobody knows how to do that. They'll hire big four and then everybody's kind of chasing their tails. Project management can become a really, and, and I'm sure that if a CISO was listening to this, they'd say, oh my gosh, like, man, this guy knows what he's talking. Like, I, you know, we run into this with like, you know, all these different resources kind of fumbling over themselves. Nobody really knows or nobody really knows uh, how to provide this intelligence to inform better decision-making. And that's what I would say at a high level, that's what we do is we can substantiate our informed decision making, whether it's metrics, the risk, what the exposure looks like, um, what do we attack first from like a crown jewels perspective? What is your high value asset that we need to secure first? Um, what is the content we need to start out with? So it's really becomes a thing of identifying the problems and then providing them solutions that are proven from organizations previous, past, present, future. You know, we, we've kind of established a process for cybersecurity and, and the digital sciences, it's like math, right? Like one plus one is always going to equal two, no matter what. So if we see one problem in one environment, we know how to solution for it. And that's what makes us great is that we can replicate uh, efforts that we've seen time and time and time again, regardless of the architecture, regardless of the, 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 the vertical or the client or whoever we're dealing with. I know that's a, a, it's a mouthful, but at a high level, it's just being able to rapidly identify, one, the problem, two, the solution, and then informing leadership on, on good decisions and making sure that they're not getting fluff, that this is an unbiased third-party decision. Uh, we're not just like a resource big four company that comes in and tells leadership what they want to hear. We're actually providing informed, substantiated uh, metrics that that can substantiate what we're saying uh, that they're, we're informing them properly and according to what we know what we've seen based on experience in other organizations all right so what does a typical client look like for you guys in terms of organization size or particular industry for example or stuff that they're you know data that they're trying to protect what what does a typical client look like for you guys a typical client right now is between 10 and 20,000 employees. Okay. And I, I won't go into some of them, some um, for NDA purposes, and won't really reveal who I'm working with or expose you know, some of the issues they have. But large, let's just say large scale organizations, anything from the retail space to the banking space to uh, intermediary transaction space. Uh, we've also dealt with I'll say this loosely, social media platform organizations, 
many different vertical spaces, um, defense, public sector. Okay, so it's typically larger organizations that probably have some sort of an internal information security division, right? And you you guys are kind of the, the hired guns to come in and, and deal with a particular project or a set. Correct, or- correct. And sometimes we're actually, it's funny to say, we're actually white labeled off by some of these bigger organizations. So I might go in and work with Deloitte. Somebody's like, hey, you're on the Deloitte Team X. And I'll say, no, I actually work for Countervale and I'm supporting Deloitte's effort here as an augmented resource because I'm facilitating a need that they cannot, you know, so trying to work the soft skills. But I wanted to circle back for a second. Our smaller clients typically deal with our product, which is our XDR solution, which to your general audience, you know, might just be antivirus. So our, our, you know, our smaller customer they want to purchase something that they know is going to work as opposed to buying something online and and not having any support for it really. Um, So I wanted to just circle back on the services side of the catalog, it's large scale organizations from the product side, it's, it's smaller organizations um, anywhere from 200 to 2000 seed organizations. So you have kind of an off the shelf product that people can use for antivirus and typical normal security issues for smaller organizations or individuals. Correct. And then there's like a service offering and a very unique uh, service level agreement that we can customize for whoever the organization is on on the smaller side of these organizations. Usually the the larger organizations, their scope of work is is very specific. Um, So they're they're high impact deliverables. And um, we typically don't go outside of what that scope of work is or the nature and scope of work. We're getting close to the end here, but a couple of things that I, that I want to to kind of hit on with you. And and, and I guess the first thing that I would say is, you know, what have you noticed organizations doing right and wrong today in terms of their security posture? Because this is, I would say that over the last decade, and you can obviously speak more to this, this sort of, thing has just exploded, right? I mean, I feel like I get spam emails and spam texts every single day, somebody trying to access something of mine. So what are other organizations doing right and what are organizations doing wrong? So first thing at a very high level, organizations that are doing things right are one, they're listening, but they have people that understand the informed decision-making And they understand that things can be very transparent, meaning they know when the BS indicator goes off and they know how to sniff through that. Those are the organizations that are doing well, that when they get informed decisions, they can sift through whether or not the validity or or if the information is substantiated and and they reciprocate, right? So your, your leadership teams that work well with your what I want to call your granular teams, your engineers, your analysts, your principals, your foot soldiers, when there's good communication between the two, that's when organizations are doing well. When you have miscommunication between leadership and your engineering, your operational teams, that's when things just go awry or when organizations are just trying to slap Band-Aid solutions in to fix a problem that never works. Uh, And I I say never, people say, oh, you should never say never. No, I'm telling you it never works when you're just trying to slap something and I'm going to buy AV, I'm going to buy a firewall. You can do all of that. It's great. That's great that you have that idea, but it's it's at the same time, it's a Band-Aid solution. If you don't know how to use it, you don't know how to stand it up. Those organizations that just are leaning on poor decision-making they don't want to listen. Leadership makes their own decisions without any informed decision making. Those are the ones who have, you know, the problems. The, the companies that I work with that I see that actually want to improve their maturity uh, from a security defense posture, they're listening. They're like, where do we go next? And we have a discussion about that. And one of the things I tell my clients is, look, I can make suggestions, but you guys have to make decisions. You know, and and that's one thing that I live on is I can suggest as best as I can based on the information that's provided to me and the information that I have according to what I've done, 
with my research in, in the organization, but you have to make the decision based on my informed information. And, you know, we call these PIRs or priority intelligence requirements and, and those usually get fed back. So organizations doing well, they're listening. Organizations doing poorly, they don't listen and they make individualized decisions and it's typically ego driven. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to communication and knowledge in so many different areas of everything, not just cybersecurity, of course, right? Yes, it does. Listening is a big is a big key. All right. So <clears throat> for organizations that don't really have a security budget, what do you suggest at a minimum that they do, right? An organization that can't afford sixty thousand dollars a year for a cybersecurity employee. Right. But they still have a need for some cybersecurity. Where where do you suggest they start? This this is a tough one, right? So there's many open source platforms out there. But again, the caveat is who is going to actually optimize them, who's going to run them. So if they, you know, if we're talking about an example, trying to work my way around this, right? If you don't have a resource to help with any of this, it's best to start out with security training and find out what employees that can self-manage on their own. Like I said, turning HTML off on your O365, implementing things like MFA, using, and I, I've mentioned this before in some of my talks, like using hard tokens, which is a key, right? Like if this key isn't plugged in, an attacker cannot bypass my email, right? So there's simple things, very, very inexpensive things that you can do to help secure your organization a bit better. When we talk about email security, which is a big attack vector, right? Everybody's coming in because it's the easiest way for attackers to get you is through email. It's like 70% right now. It's, it's a bypass method. Um, that's what attackers do. They fish you all day. They steal your password. They log in as you. And, you know, the better you can hunker down your email, like you can secure yourself a little bit better and doing so by using MFA, turning it off, not associate. I mean, there's a laundry list of things, you know, not associating your company email with everything else, your Facebook, your Instagram, there, there's, there's a multitude of things that they can implement. And, and if I were to tell one of your customers, like, look, if you guys gave countervail a call, we can give you a list for free. This is what you want to do. If you have zero budget, this is where you should start because there's a laundry list of things that you can do that we probably don't have time for today on the call to kind of go through and say, turn this on, turn that on, do this, do that. There's a huge list of things that they can do very low cost. You know, we're talking under a thousand dollars for an organization um, at minimum. I mean, getting a security video and having your employees watch it once a month, create a cybersecurity awareness month. Even if your employees hate it, set up a, a lunch and learn like, hey, we're going to have taco Tuesday, but we're going to teach you guys what not to do. Um, you know, there's simple things that you can do. It, it sounds corny, but you know, big organizations are doing this, you know, because there's people who just, they, it doesn't resonate. I'm going to keep clicking this link until I kill my company. You know, it's, um, it's just one of those things, you know, I, I don't understand it, but it, it's, I, we kind of laugh at it. It's kind of funny. It's kind of not, but uh, this is something that, that occurs frequently. You know, this is what attackers love. They love that email vector. They can get in there. So it's the most easiest target. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, if, if, if the listeners are anything like me, this is, it's, it's kind of a refresher, right? Like we all know this is a, a major threat. It's something we need to do better. We need to have whatever randomized passwords for our, for our bank, you know, access or, you know, all these kinds of things. Yeah. That, it shouldn't that, be like unicorn 101 or kitty 2020, yeah. or, you know, do away with that stuff. Your password should at minimum be like 15 characters, mix, match, upper, lower case. You know, you should have MFA or a token. You know, these are some practices. You should never use the same password on your Instagram, your Facebook, your LinkedIn. They should all be different. Uh, you should use an external password safe. So you store all your passwords, let's say on a key drive that you plug in. As we saw in the last pass breach, everybody's passwords got compromised. It's an in-the-browser password safe. That, that went to show the community, well, look, you can't even trust a password safe that's in your browser. LastPass got compromised. All those passwords gone. Think of all the millions of people who had to change their passwords. But again, yeah, there's, there's a huge laundry list of things that you can do 
at zero cost to secure your organization as best you can, right? When we're talking about something with no budget, there's plenty of things. Yeah, so that that password keeper that you just showed, it's essentially a thumb drive that you plug in Correct. and your passwords for everything are in there. And unless that's plugged in, you can't access the different places you're trying to go, correct? Correct. And let's say there's a master password to get into your actual thumb drive. So before you can even log into your thumb drive, you have to have a master password that logs in to get you to all of your passwords. And then it becomes a click and paste. You unplug it when you don't need it. You turn it off and remove it from your, your laptop. Um, you know, But at minimum, you should have some sort of antivirus, a good antivirus. You know, If I was a company... Again, I, I could sit here and say, yes, get countervail, you know, but no, I mean, if you're just a company who needs some bare minimum stuff, Bitdefender, and again, I'm, this isn't a plug or anything, Bitdefender doesn't pay me to do that, but Bitdefender is a, is a good solution for AV. You know, if you're just minimally trying to, I mean, you think you can get Bitdefender for around $60 a year, maybe five licenses. So, you know, depending on how many employees you have, 60 times, you know, plus five, and then round out your employees and they all get a license. They offer VPN, they offer scanning. I mean, it's kind of like a no brainer tool if you're just a company who just needs some bare minimum. But again, that's like super low budget, no nonsense stuff. I personally have some of my guys running Bitdefender separately just as, just to have something added. But it's a it's a proven solution. I'm, I'm not trying to plug it. It's just something that, you know, I've used in the past and given the question, you know, what, what should I tell my pe people to use, you know, if they don't have a budget, yeah, just throw Bitdefender on there, use your password keys, get a thumb drive from Google. It's called Google Titan. You know, it's, it costs $50. That might be a bit more pricey. Actually, it might be $35 for the Titan key, but it secures your Gmail. Unless that thing's plugged in, no one can use your email. So it's, it's, it's as secure as you're going to get. You know, unless an attacker is forcing you to put your finger and touch the the key, then, you know, they're not getting in. But All right. Well, I'll tell you, I've, I've learned some things along the way. Uh, I appreciate your background. I, I want to make sure that I that I mention how much we appreciate your service. You know, being a veteran in our country, that means a lot to us at the program here. So thank you for that. I appreciate and, I volunteered and family tradition. Well, it, it's appreciated. So. Thank you very much for that. And, and I've enjoyed the conversation. So I appreciate you being here. But before we let you go, why don't you tell the, the listeners how to get in touch with Countervail, how to get in touch with you personally, whatever you'd like to do there. Yeah. So for anybody who's curious at all, I mean, you can just go to the countervail.com, the C-O-U-N-T-E-R-V-E-I-L, the countervail.com. You can look us up. It'll populate right away in any you know search browser. Um, our phone number uh, is, uh, I can't even think of my own phone number, 844-783-6660. And, um, you know, you can communicate with me directly there if, if I'm available. And, you know, I have no problem answering any questions, comments, concerns, you know, you may have if you're interested. Feel free to reach out. Um, yeah, I'm not one of these organizations where I'm so you know, high on the podium now that I, I just can't take calls anymore. So, you know, I'm actually interested in helping out organizations regardless. You know, I don't mind giving you free solutions to help you if you have no budget. It, it doesn't matter to me. My my passion is cybersecurity and, and driving, you know, maturity and, and, and security awareness to, to any company by and large, big, small. So um, again, the countervail.com. 844-783-6660. And uh, yeah, leave a message for me. Call me directly. I think my extension is two. Well, thanks so much again for being here. Really appreciated the conversation. Hopefully you were uh, as happy with your Valentine as I am with mine. <laughs> and uh, really appreciate the conversation. Thank you for having me, sir. Appreciate you. You bet. Thanks you. Thank you, Izzy. Thanks. You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, a podcast for small business owners by small business owners. Join us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Arizona time for an introduction to another great tycoon. And be sure to follow us on our social media channels for links to all of our episodes and great content.